What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Philosopher, and I'd like to start this video out with a little bit of a story. I started karate way too young. I was about four at the time, and you had better believe I did not know anything about karate at that point. I didn't even know it was a thing that existed. My parents were responsible for signing me up, and really pure luck was responsible for me ending up in a dojo that, looking back on it, still, I think, provided a really good karate education for me. They signed me up for it specifically because a family friend of ours had decided to try it out, and his parents wanted him to have a familiar face in the class, so that was me. He ended up stopping a few years later, and well, I've continued for the rest of my life. Like almost any dojo that wants to be commercially viable nowadays, and as you can probably guess by the fact that I was a child when I started, this dojo had a child's program that was specifically developed around children's empowerment, and emotional development and things like that. It was both a way of keeping the doors open and a way of introducing children to the idea of karate young so that they could get attached to it and find out whether they wanted to do it or not. However, to avoid the all too common phenomenon of child black belts and a lower overall standard of teaching, this children's program had a completely different curriculum and a completely separate belt system. Children in the program, such as myself, effectively remained white belts, and their progression through the child's curriculum was marked by colored stripes down the center of their white belt, which mimicked the progression of the adult belt system. By the time you made it through the whole kid's syllabus, which took a few years at the minimum, even if you were as young as I was when I started, you would at least be old enough to begin to learn some of the body mechanics for the actual curriculum. I know that a lot of people might be worried a little bit by that description that I was in a McDojo situation, but honestly, it definitely wasn't. We learned actual techniques as best as we were able, and the dojo made it very clear that this wasn't some sort of program that offered a guaranteed black belt in so many years, or that it was even the main purpose of what they taught. That was the adult classes. It was both a conscious compromise that was made in order to keep the dojo in the black, and a way of introducing kids to karate so that they could develop a passion for it and continue when they were a little bit older. In my case, clearly, that last goal worked very, very well. But they had to advertise the program, and in order to make sure that it could pay the rent, they had to give it a nice and snappy name to get people to sign up. And the name that they came up with was Nihai Samurai. How many of you guys had a similar experience that was what got you into karate? Here in America, at least, most people who get involved in East Asian martial arts like karate or kung fu, or even stuff like Aikido and Kendo, are at least somewhat motivated by the fact that martial arts are, well, kind of cool. Japan specifically has made a policy of trying to promote itself in the pop culture imaginations of the rest of the world, which is why you'll occasionally see things like anime produced for Western audiences, or of course, various karate organizations trying to colonize America. During the Meiji and Taisho periods, various Japanese figures tried to promote Westernness as being the new cool. And on the other side, Americans have especially after the post-war economic miracle, been bombarded with people promoting an image of cool Japan. And of course, quite possibly one of the coolest things about Japan were its samurai. So many Western advertisers have promoted Bushido and samurai ethics as being a way of getting ahead in life. Some of this is just repurposing old Japanese writings like the Book of Five Rings as if they were modern-day business manuals, as if the multiple sections on how you hold your sword or how to cut down an opponent have anything to do with closing a deal. Other times, it takes the form of the ridiculous works of celebrated crackpot Antony Cummins, who wrote a whole book on how to be a modern samurai warrior. But sadly, I've seen way too many actual adult karateka who genuinely believe that their practice is designed to turn them into some sort of modern bushi, who's just two swords short of wandering down the streets of 17th century Edo, cutting down commoners for looking at them wrong. And I'm sorry, but you are not a samurai. Let's get into it. The first order of business is to remind you that Bushido, as a concept, doesn't actually belong to karate, or for that matter, really to any other Japanese martial art. The term Bushido was invented to describe the morality and etiquette associated with the warrior class during what is occasionally called Japan's feudal period. If you've been watching my channel for some time, then I assume that you know that during Japan's feudal period, Okinawa wasn't a part of Japan, 
meaning that the people who developed and created karate were not Japanese, let alone samurai. Sure, the Satsuma domain likely sent some samurai to Shuri Castle every now and then to check in on the Shou dynasties behind the scenes, but the martial arts that were practiced in Ryukyu were kept relatively secret from them, and besides, those samurai probably had their own martial traditions that took precedence for them. I am also obliged to mention that even the samurai themselves didn't follow some rigid moral code of Bushido, and they definitely weren't all Zen Buddhists as some matter of course. Oleg Benesh wrote a very in-depth article demonstrating beyond a shadow of reasonable doubt that the actual historical connection between samurai and the idea of Bushido is very minimal at best. One of the central pieces of textual evidence often used to promote the ideology of Bushido, the Hagakure, was written an entire century after the beginning of the Pax Tokugawa, when the samurai had long since undergone the transition from warriors to essentially stipended bureaucrats. Really, the political invention of Bushido was Japan's attempt to find a similar cultural heritage to the Western concept of chivalry, which, as a side note, if you look into the history of knights and the feudal period in Europe, was no doubt a similar sort of projection of modern morals and ideals back onto the past. The samurai as such really didn't practice or follow Bushido, and even if they had, that would have absolutely nothing to do with the history of karate or of the Okinawans. What's really weird is that this idea that karate seeks to develop Bushido ethics rubs up against the other very common myth about karate's origins, that it was invented by peasants in order to fight off the invading Japanese samurai. Of the two of these stories, the latter is much less true, since practitioners of Tei were generally members of the upper class or of the royalty, or at the very least came from families that were wealthy enough to where they could afford to take quite a while off of the manual labor that actual peasants spent most of their time doing. But to be honest, this ideological tension actually makes a little bit of sense, since the very concept of Bushido was invented by a group of people who had a real distaste for samurai. Towards the end of the Tokugawa period, many Japanese people, especially the burgeoning merchant class, had grown fed up of the samurai of their era, who were by and large prideful bureaucrats whose stipends represented an immense expenditure for the government. The solution that was eventually hit upon by the pioneers of Bushido was to claim that these more modern Tokugawa samurai were pretenders who had fallen from glory and forgotten their noble roots. Bushido was, at the same time, a glorification of the old moral standards of the warrior's caste, and indirectly a means of unifying the Japanese people as a group, and also a way of fighting back against a bloated and inefficient central government. Of course, some of karate's pioneers leaned very heavily into the idea of Bushido as a way of making their practice seem more legitimate. Miyagi Chojun Sensei specifically promoted his Goju Ryu as a way of developing a Budo mindset when he was presenting about its benefits to the Dainippon Butoku Kai. However, this was probably as much of a political choice as the invention of Bushido was. Miyagi was caught in a delicate balance between attempting to popularize karate and ensure its continued existence in the harsh political climate of 1930s Japan, while at the same time attempting to maintain a close tie to Okinawan culture and its cultural heritage. In his Karate do Gaisetsu, Miyagi specifically says that the kata Sanshin and Naihanshi encourage a Budo spirit, but this was almost certainly an addition that he made for the benefit of the Japanese audience to whom he was presenting. And when the Showa government later started to use Bushido as a way of recruiting its next generation of young soldiers, this Budo spirit didn't result in the same kind of mass enlistment for which many other young Japanese men volunteered. If you really want to be a modern-day samurai, you're much better served by learning one of the styles derived from arts that the samurai actually practiced, such as Aikido, Kendo, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu if you can find a good extant Ryu, or even some of the more uncommon styles like Kyudo and Naginata. Interestingly enough, the one Japanese martial art that mostly escaped the craze of Bushido being used to promote it to new practitioners is Judo, the only one of their arts that is an Olympic sport, and the one that modern practitioners of MMA consider to be the most practical and effective. Of course, there are no doubt a few judoka who still get starry-eyed thinking about the Muromachi period or whatever, but in general, an obsession with being a hardened, mythic badass generally seems to be inversely proportional with actual combat effectiveness. But there's actually another, even more important reason why karate practice will not turn you into a samurai. 
There are no more samurai in the world. I mean, I'm sure there are still plenty of people who are descended from samurai families, but after the Meiji Restoration, their power was more or less stripped, their stipends were converted into government bonds which quickly went away, and most of them moved on to greener pastures like business or politics. For instance, descendants of the Shimazu clan went on to form a very successful scientific technology corporation. But people don't walk around with swords anymore. Or if they do, they quickly get arrested. We don't live in feudal times anymore, and the fact that central governments have furnished police forces in order to enforce their laws means that not only do you not have to, but that sometimes if you try to anyway, you yourself will be in violation of the law. Even during the most tumultuous parts of the Warring States period, real-life samurai weren't going around having that many duels or defeating that many evildoers, and that's before the civilian police force got their hands on the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. If you try to act like a samurai in real life today, then you will get thrown into prison incredibly quickly. Japanophiles like Antony Cummins, specifically the type that don't actually care about understanding Japanese history or culture with any real nuance, will blithely claim that not only do they follow the way of the samurai, but you can too, by buying their 500 books. A lot of this is just standard corporate motivational garbage with a Japanese aesthetic, like selling the Book of Five Rings as a modern-day businessman's strategy guide, but occasionally it gets to be just outright absurd. To demonstrate, let me just read you the chapter titles from Antony Cummins' book, How to Be a Modern Samurai. Step 1. Control your mind. Step 2. Lead a samurai lifestyle. Step 3. Engage strategically with the world. Alright, so far so good. Nothing bad here. Step four, build a fortress. Okay. Uh, step five, follow a way. <laughs> step six, build an army. Uh, you know, I think that we call those militias nowadays, and generally speaking, it's illegal. Step seven, understand the way of war. Step eight, adopt the way of the ninja. I thought this was samurais. Step 9, study samurai magic. Uh, what the fuck? And step 10, tread the spiritual path. Antony Cummins is a crackpot. That's clear from the whole samurai magic thing. You don't have to take him seriously. I skimmed my way through a digital copy of the book because I do not want to give that man money, and the contents are basically what you would expect from those chapter titles. Half 12 rules for life, and half ninja larper making up his own style of kung fu in his parents' backyard. But the allure of samurai as a concept is so seductive that even just the dumbest writing imaginable that includes legitimate sections on how to properly display the decapitated heads of your enemies, I'm not kidding, can not only get published, but it can get book deals and just make so much money. But even for all that, you are not a samurai because the last samurai has already died. He may not have technically been the last one, but Saigo Takamori is often called the last true samurai. You might know him both for helping to lead the Boshin War, which resulted in the Meiji Restoration, and also for being so dissatisfied with the Meiji government for accepting Western influence and not going to war with Korea, that he led a rebellion against the very government that he had fought to create, with the result that he was killed dead. In fact, his Satsuma Rebellion was both costly and ineffective, and really served to demonstrate just how much stronger a commoner's army outfitted with modern guns and artillery was when compared to the once-proud warrior class. Is that really the model that you want to emulate? Even if you don't literally think that karate will turn you into a samurai, which I would think was common sense, but looking through the karate tag on Instagram, I'm not so sure anymore. That isn't even the sort of mindset that you should be trying to develop. For most of us karateka, our martial arts skills will never be put to the test on the streets, and maybe will just barely be expressed through competition. And like, not to be the joker or anything, but we live in a society. You can't just go around beating people up to settle your arguments. And I don't just mean legally, although to be clear, beating people up is generally frowned upon by the law as well. 
Learning karate, learning martial arts, will not make you invincible. And even if it did, it certainly won't make you immune to people thinking that you're kind of an a-hole. And for the love of Hachiman, there is nothing more embarrassing than being the kind of person who takes your martial arts way too seriously. There's nothing wrong with getting a cultural or even a spiritual enjoyment out of your time at the dojo, but be chill about it. Unless you're a one-in-a-million talent like Muhammad Ali or Master Ken, you don't even have to be the best. Just have fun with it. But if, after all this, you're still committed to being a samurai, then you'd better be ready to play the part. Meet me for swords at dawn. Thanks for watching this ranty one. I'm gonna be honest, Koryu Bujutsu practitioners and Hima enthusiasts have the right idea. If you're gonna pretend to be a samurai or a knight or whatever, then, you know, just lean all the way into it and hit each other with swords. In fact, you know what? I wanna give a shout out to Poor Man's Hima, a channel where they do more or less exactly that. Hit each other with swords, but in an historically accurate fashion. And did you know that the last samurai existed at the same time as cowboys? Petition to put a samurai in every Western movie. Oh hey, if you enjoyed me crushing people's dreams about being a samurai, then you should like this video and leave a comment letting me know what the most embarrassing part of your martial art is and why it's us. Don't insult other people's martial arts, that's not cool, but hey, a little self-deprecation goes a long way to not taking yourself too seriously. If you want to see me make fun of myself and of karate in the future, then I'm probably going to do that in a few videos, so you might as well subscribe and turn on those notifications so as you'll know when I upload the new ones, you see? Why did I write that in a gangster movie accent? Uh, that's in the script, by the way. I, I wrote it like that. I've been the Goji Ryu Philosopher, and if you'll excuse me, I gotta go do my suburi.